Okay, so now we're going to talk about the second stage of labor. The second stage of labor is from the time of full dilation of the cervix through the birth of the infant. So once the cervix is fully dilated, we talked on the previous recording that the woman would then start having that urge to push. So definitely want to promote effective pushing. So here's where we get a little bit of coaching going on. We want to help her with her breathing. We want to help her with positioning. Uh, what would be ideally, you know, a lot of times when the mom is getting ready to push, that's when the legs go up into the stirrups and they break down the bottom of the bed to make it, uh, the doctor then would have easier access to be able to maneuver the baby and get the baby out. So um, definitely there is a little bit of work for us to do to help mom uh, have a more effective pushing effort. Okay, preparation for the birth, uh, bulging of the perineum and the rectum. If you go to your textbook on page 455, there's a picture at the bottom of the page, figure 12-36, which um, shows crowning. So that's where the presenting part is starting to really bulge and we know that the birth is going to be imminent. Uh, flattening and thinning of the perineum, increase in the bleeding, and uh, the labia may begin then to separate. So imminent birth, they get the crowning. You can see the head is starting to come out. Some women may complain of a burning sensation. This is actually related to the perineum as it stretches. There's definitely going to be intense pressure in the rectum area. This is where they are at risk for lacerations as the head is descending, as the head is starting to present and come out. The tissues can actually tear. So lacerations are not a good thing. Uh, they can cause uh, postpartum hemorrhage. They can be one of the contributors to that. An episiotomy is a much better option. That's a surgical cutting of the tissues. Obviously, it's easier to repair a nice smooth cut of tissue than it is to repair lacerations that are very jagged. The most common type of episiotomy is the midline. So basically the provider makes an incision from the vagina down towards the rectum and this is supposed to uh, accommodate the birth of the baby. So obviously it makes more room for the baby and it helps to prevent those lacerations from occurring. The cardinal movements of birth they are used to describe how the fetus passes through the birth canal and the positional changes required to facilitate birth. Descent, so that's where the head is entering the maternal inlet, can be occiput, transverse, or oblique because the inlet is wide from side to side. This is where um, you get the uh, measurements as stations. When we're talking about descent, um, I talked about that in the previous recording. So the ischial spines is your zero. If it's above the ischial spines, it's a negative number. If it's below the ischial spines, then it's a positive number. Flexion is when the head is coming down and it comes into contact with the soft tissues of the pelvis, the muscles of the pelvic floor, and the cervix. The pressure that's exerted on the head when this happens uh, makes the uh, chin go then towards the baby's chest. As the baby is continuing its descent and getting down into the maternal pelvis, the head actually has to rotate in order for the baby to fit. So that's the internal rotation. Extension, so the baby's head is passing under the, the symphysis pubis of the mom. It does meet resistance with the pelvic floor. The head will pivot and then it extends with each pushing. Restitution is when the baby's head rotates, the shoulders will then enter the maternal pelvis in an oblique position. After the head is delivered, in the extended position, uh, that's a lot of times where you see the, the provider then turning the baby, and that's why, because they don't want the shoulders to get stuck, because that can obviously cause problems for the baby. 
external rotation so as the shoulders become more aligned the head then continues to turn farther to one side which is considered external rotation the expulsion obviously here the baby is coming out you can see a really good pictorial representation of this on page 459 in your textbook Okay, so cord clamping, there is some controversy about when to clamp the cord. There's a lot of research that suggests it is beneficial to the baby to wait to clamp the cord, uh, especially for a term baby. So if the baby is held above the placenta, then blood from the baby is going to then go into the placenta because until the cord is cut, it's an open conduit for the blood to move back and forth. If, on the other hand, the placenta is above the baby, then they'll get blood from the placenta that then will get into the baby. And that, um, they, you know, they think that that's going to help if, if that occurs where blood is coming from the placenta, that that will help with some of that iron deficiency that a lot of the newborns have because the baby will get anywhere from 50 to 100 mils of blood from the placenta. The nurse is going to want to take a look at that cord. We want to make sure that the two arteries and the one vein are there. I think we talked about this in class that if those one or the other of those uh, structures are missing, that could mean that there was a problem with the baby's development. The baby could possibly have kidney issues. So uh, that's why the, the nurse is going to be making sure that she checks that. If they need to collect a cord sample for whatever reason, this is the time that they're going to be doing that as well. The third stage of labor is after the birth of the baby to the complete delivery of the placenta. So that is what is considered then the third stage of labor. It could take uh, five to 10 minutes, but sometimes it could take up to 30 minutes. The uterus actually changes its shape. Uh, this leads to the separation of the placenta. It becomes more spherical shaped um, as the uh, placenta is descending into the vagina the uh, uterus will actually uh, rise up into the abdomen the umbilical cord descends further through the vagina and then they will get a gush of blood from the vagina as the placenta then is expelled i'll say so nursing care after the baby has delivered uh, they want to know if the placenta has detached. So um, they're going to be checking the uterus to see its size. Remember, it changes its shape. It becomes more spherical or more of a globe size. So um, they may have to ask the woman to push some more to get the placenta to come out. Um, they may need to give oxy, uh, they will give uh, oxytocin type medications because postpartum hemorrhage, as we discussed last week, is the most common cause of maternal fatality. So the oxytocin medication is going to uh, contribute to those uterine contractions that we want. We want that uterus to be nice and contracted to control the bleeding. Because when the placenta detaches, there's actually open vessels there. There are vessels that form while the placenta is attached to help to nourish the placenta to you know feed the placenta blood but once the placenta detaches those vessels are now open and that's a lot of time where the bleeding can come from uh, immediate care of the newborn right they're going to want to dry the baby they want to stimulate the baby they want to make sure that the baby's doing okay and then after you know as long as the baby is stable and mom is doing okay they're going to put that baby right to her chest and maybe try to get the baby to breastfeed there and that's usually going to occur within that first hour the fourth stage of labor after the delivery of the placenta through the first couple of hours after birth. So the nurse is going to be monitoring the uterus. They're going to be monitoring that fundus, make sure that it's nice and firm. Uh, we don't want a boggy uterus. That means that there could be potential bleeding. If there is, we need to let the uh, provider know right away. The first thing that the nurse would do then is do a fundal massage. That's something that we can do without an order. We can just do it. And what that does is that helps to trigger those uterine contractions. We want that uterus to stay nice and contracted, nice and firm. 
some nursing care during this fourth stage, uh, looking at the lochia or the bleeding that is coming. Obviously, monitoring that first four hours is when they are most likely to have a hemorrhage. If they are going to have one, that's usually the most likely time. Going to keep track of the vitals, right? First sign of bleeding is a drop in the blood pressure and increase in the heart rate. Uh, get that baby to the chest, uh, promote breastfeeding, promote attachment, and make sure that you're helping the mom to stay comfortable, so providing her with any comfort measures that she needs. Okay, so now um, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time going through uh, in Chapter 14 some of the complications that can occur during the labor and the birth. I'm going to talk about some specific ones. I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, just the ones that I feel are the most important for you to know. To start off, dystocia simply means that it's been, the labor has been long, it's been difficult, or it's abnormal in some way. And they can usually arise from the three components, the powers, the passenger, or the passageway. Either one of those three, or all three combined, can cause problems during the labor and can make it a very difficult process. Uter umbilical cord prolapse, we talked about this last week during class. This is considered an emergency. If you see the cord coming out first, the first thing you're going to do is uh, get a sterile glove on, get your hand in there, and to lift the cord up to get the pressure off of the cord. You're not going to try to push it back in. That's not what you're going to do. You're just going to kind of hold it up so that when they get those contractions, they're not getting pressure on the cord, but that baby is going to need to be born cesarean section, and it's going to need to be born very quickly. Whenever you're in an emergency situation, you always want to call for help. You never want to be in that room by yourself. Uh, you're going to want to change mom's position in some way. To, you can put her to her left lateral like you see at the bottom of this picture here. You can put her knees uh, to chest, um, but you're going to want to any way you can to get the pressure off of that cord. And as you see in the top right hand corner there, there's the hand there kind of holding the cord up. But no matter what you do, whichever position you put the mom in, getting help in there and letting them know that you've got an emergency is most important. Uh, instrument assisted birth, so if they had to use forceps to get the baby out, as you see in the uh, pictorial example here, that baby is in a breech presentation and they had to use the forceps to get the head to deliver. Uh, vacuum extraction, if for some reason the baby just doesn't want to come out, then they'll use what they call a kiwi to uh, make suction on the baby's head to get the baby's head to deliver. There are risks to the baby in both of these types of delivery with the um, forceps. They can actually incur nerve damage to their face, uh, can cause kind of a, a Bell's palsy or a palsy of some sort uh, or a facial drooping, and that's permanent, that doesn't go away. With the vacuum extraction, these babies can actually be at increased risk for hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, they can develop uh, blood clots under there, the hematomas. So um, those are all definitely considerations for both of these types of deliveries. It's not something that they're going to want to jump to right away, but if that's the only way they can get the baby out, then that's what they have to do. With your post-term, that's any uh, pregnancy that extends beyond 42 weeks, they can have fetal problems. Uh, they can have increased risk of meconium aspiration, uh, placental insufficiency because the placenta is aging. They have an increased risk for infection or that chorioamnitis that I talked about last week. So they definitely, it's not a good thing for the baby to be in there too long. Their skin a lot of times is very leathery looking after they deliver because the vernix that they have to protect their skin starts to diminish. Uh, uterine complications, so uterine rupture, we did talk about that a little bit last week. The baby can actually come out of the uterus into the abdominal cavity with that. Uh, the last complication that I'm going to spend some time on is the amniotic fluid embolism. So amniotic fluid actually enters the bloodstream of the mother and that triggers a reaction that results in very rapid deterioration of mom, cardiorespiratory collapse, massive bleeding, coagulopathy. Uh, sometimes these moms can end up going into DIC. 
So we'll be talking more about this in class, but those were the most important uh, complications of labor that I wanted you guys to know about. The other one, of course, is the abruption. We talked about that last week, and we're going to cover that more in class. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.